Just over a year and a half ago, the government here, thank you very much, abolished the wine tax and said they plan to turn Hong Kong into a premier, an on-premier wine hub. At the big shindig this week, we're having an international wine and spirits fair. Merchants and critics started debating intensely whether we're achieving that or not. Paul, everybody's flogging off their wares with one eye, drooling over the rich Chinese. But are we the big wine hub that we're supposed to be? Or are we just one big, huge retail shopping center? Well, that was the big question. And what better place to debate it than at a wine fair over a nice uh, glass of white or red or whatever your preference would be? But it was a lot of people there, actually. Uh, thousands of people, hundreds of exhibitors, uh, three large halls at the conference center. And that was really one of the questions on uh, the mind there. What really is a wine hub? It seems that almost everyone in the industry wants to sell wine, like most goods, to China. And Hong Kong wants to be the wine hub that delivers it, which is why it made the drink duty-free. And wine merchants responded, increasing imports 80% in 2008 and 42% so far this year. Well, China and Hong Kong have been really important for many of our customers this year, accounting for perhaps 40 to 60 percent of their business. And they've really helped in what's been a difficult period, um, particularly in Europe and the U.S., to smooth out the marketplace. Many of the exhibitors here are Hong Kong companies selling wine. There's no doubt that the abolition of duty has boosted the market. The question is, who are they selling to? Or in other words, what actually is a wine hub? As a regional hub for more broad-based, large-volume commercial grades of wine, um, I would qualify that. I think uh, perhaps as a sub-regional hub, uh, it would have realistic uh, ambitions, particularly with respect to the mainland, um, as an obvious hub for supporting and developing uh, the wine industry in southeastern China. Wine shipped through Hong Kong to mainland China is still taxed. For high-volume wines, that means Hong Kong has no significant advantage over centers such as Shanghai. Low volume fine wines may be a different story. Hong Kong's wine auction market overtook London this year, becoming the world's second biggest after New York. Though just two brands really count, Chateau Lafitte Rothschild and Chateau Petrus. Very, very heavy demand for Lafitte Rothschild in particular. In fact, anything to do with Lafitte. Um, Lafitte has accounted for 24 percent of our business in 2009, which is, is a staggering Percentage. Yeah, that's the, 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 the big brands and the big names. Of course, they are rare, they are very expensive, a lot of collectors are rich and think, but that's the beginning. At one Hong Kong auction last month, the mainland Chinese bidder bought a six litre bottle of Petrus. The price, a record 94,000 US dollars. So there you go, 94,000 for a uh, Chateau Petrus, the uh, 89 Rothschild you saw there. That's a lot cheaper, a mere 500 oh, US dollars. Goodness grief there. Um, can I ask a, what might be a really stupid question? Mm -hmm. um, in France or the UK or other places, it's cool. It's, they're pretty cool climates. Right? Yes. Good to wine. Well, no, not the UK. A little bit of the UK. Yeah, but if you leave yeah. wine sitting on the tarmac at Chekmapkok Airport for any amount of time, mm. it's going to ruin it. Well, uh, the uh, Financial Secretary, John Chung, was speaking at the uh, um, convention here, and he said that they're, they're trying to develop a customs clearance so the wine can move more swiftly through Hong Kong and uh, better storage as well, encouraging uh, higher quality storage in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, the storage is expensive in Hong Kong. All the winemakers there told me that. The clearance, well, they want to see how well that works, but that's one thing that would help the business. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, good, good, for, good for John Zung, though. Uh, good, it was Henry Tang who actually eliminated the wine. Uh, he, that was 18 months ago in his budget, that's right. right. Yes. Okay. He well, doesn't turn up because he's a uh, enophile himself and he doesn't want a conflict of interest. He actually drinks Mouton Ross Shield every night for dinner. <laughs> Unlike us, we open it once a lifetime. Uh, Southeast Asian siblings in a spat. We're talking Thailand and Cambodia. Fran has an update on that running story. Fran. Bernie, an already shaky relationship shaken even more by talks in Shinawat. Thailand's government is furious that Cambodia has named the former Thai Prime Minister economic advisor, and they're pull, they've pulled out an, its ambassador out of the country. Now, the current Thai Prime Minister, Abhisi Vedajiva, said the appointment was inappropriate and that it'll review all bilateral agreements. Hours later, Cambodia followed suit, pulling its ambassador out of Thailand. 
Now, Thaksin is a controversial figure in his home country. He was ousted in a coup three years ago and is on the run from a two-year prison sentence for abusing his power. The Thaksin fiasco erupted last month when Prime Minister Hun Sen asked Thaksin to become his aide and offering him a place to stay in Cambodia. And the two countries have already been at loggerheads fighting over a border region with casualties on both sides. And it's not the first time that Thailand pulled its ambassador out of Cambodia. It did that in 2003 before, and Cambodians burned down the embassy and attacked Thai businesses. So hopefully that won't happen, but still, so toxin constantly in the hair of current leader Abbasid and causing him trouble not only at home, but also abroad. Bernie? Abbasid having a bad hair day. All right, we're uh, warming up and leading up to the real trade. At the top of the hour, Haas Linda has a quick uh, bullet point on what's cooking. Happy Friday, Haas. I'm expecting a real bang-up show, okay? I'm going to be there. I'm going to write to oh. you, actually. You never write me. You bet. <laughs> you know... I know you love cars. This is the show for you, Buns. We're talking autos on the trade today. No, not your Beamer, but Toyota, which reported a smaller loss for a second time. Improved numbers coming on the back of better outlook for Honda and Nissan as well. What will all, what will all that mean for auto stocks in Japan? We'll have the answers on the trade. So see you at the top of the hour. Burns? I can't wait. It's such sex appeal with those hybrids and electric cars. You go... FX Pro. Trade Forex like a pro. Now in its sixth year, every November, Trade Tech Asia brings together the top buy side and sell side from across Asia. Two full days, giving you over 20 hours of networking and presentations from leading experts Mark Faber, Daryl Guppy and Martin Wheatley. Your competitors and your contemporaries will be there. Will you register your team today? at www.tradetechasia.com. One of the largest equity investors in emerging markets. Emerging market experts, Mirai Asset.